Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the webinar today on copyright in the US and Canada compared, why taking advantage of fair use for education doesn't cro cause cross-border incompatibility. My name is Meredith Jacob, I'm the public lead for Creative Commons US and the leader of the Creative Commons project at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University Washington College of Law. Um, our webinar today is designed to address questions that have come up about compatibility for um, OER that relies on fair use or fair dealing for projects that cross the US-Canada border. So as people create OER, we found that it's increasingly very important as people try to build out into new subjects and to create new resources for authors and educators to be able to rely on the limitations and exceptions in copyright law to build high quality materials that reflect the um, existing world they live in. So as we create open educational resources, the new content is released under the Creative Commons standard copyright licenses, but there are times when to teach a historical point for criticism or for review, you need to um, include existing third party materials. And as uh, authors and educators do that, there's often a question of when I use those materials, have I created problems for reusers in other jurisdictions? And one of the prime uh, sort of communities of practice is a community that crosses the US Canada border. And so this webinar is intended to explain how for many of the core educational purposes, the law in the US under fair use and the law in Canada under fair dealing actually permit uh, many of the same educational uses. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, Will Cross, who's a lawyer and librarian and serves as the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries to tell us a little bit about what these open education uh, communities and institutions are that cross that border. Will, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Meredith, for having me and thank you all for joining us today for this discussion. So exactly as you said, the reason this webinar and this work is so critical is because open educational resources, OER, um, are designed to be sort of international and to cross borders. And in practice, that's how they work and are made and shared and sort of made most powerful in a lot of different ways. The ideal, going back to the, the very earliest stages of the open community and the open education community, has been to have this sort of global community of practice, sharing ideas and um, sort of forking or, or remixing things in different ways to build on and tailor and then localize as well. So you've got this huge body of practice bringing the, the best ideas and the coolest new approaches, and then everybody can pull from that shared set of resources and localize them and tailor them in different ways. And in fact, I'm happy to say that is the reality of open education as well. Precisely as Meredith said, that's happening at the global level and it's particularly the case in the context of North America. Uh, the US and Canada both have a robust body of creators, producers, and remixers of open education. In the US, we might point to the Open Textbook Network, to OpenStax, and to Spark. In Canada, we might point to BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, Rebus, and Pressbooks, and I'm leaving amazing producers on both sides of the border out. Um, but, but you have lots of great materials being created in both spots that frequently cross the border and then are localized in different ways. Um, so an example I often give about what makes an OER cool is the folks at eCampus will do this thing where they uh, Canadaize or Canadianize a US resource. And in the US, of course, we do the same thing. We find an amazing resource that talks in the context of the Canadian government or Canadian money or Canadian whatever, and we localize it to our US or in my case, my North Carolina context as well. So that, that practice is thriving and incredibly critical to the success of open education and baked into the heart of why we make our educational resources open in the first place. So I'm so excited to hear this discussion about the way the law sort of aligns so very nicely in this space where it needs to align very nicely. Thanks, Will. Yeah. Um, so Will's given us this sort of background of why there are these projects where it's really important that the materials used are functional and um, legal in both jurisdictions. And so on the next slide, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Professor Michael Carroll, 
Uh, Michael is a professor of law and director of the program on information justice and intellectual property. He teaches and writes about intellectual property law and cyber law and is a founding member of Creative Commons and an expert on copyright in the digital world. Mike is going to tell us a little bit about why fair use loves education and why it's one of the key things it enables. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Yes, thanks. And I, I just had a quick look at the participant list and saw a lot of familiar names. So hi, folks. Um, okay, so if we could get to the next slide. Um, so I, what you have on the slide there is, is language out of the United States Constitution, but I would say um, copyright law, certainly in the uh, tradition coming out of English law, has always placed educational uses um, as, as a central uh, policy uh, goal of the act. The, the very first Copyright Act, the Statute of Anne, was named an act for the encouragement of learning. And the basic theory has always been that the production of knowledge requires some economic incentives and exclusive rights provides uh, that incentives. Um, and in order to take a chance on some new uh, publishing venture, um, some level of exclusivity is needed in order to fend off uh, the, the person who waits only for the successful uh, work. But that, that, that those exclusive rights need to be balanced. Um, and this has always been a part of, of the copyright system. Even in the, the justification of copyright that originated in France and in continental Europe that focuses more on the, the author's rights, educational use and educational outcomes has always been an important part of why, what, you know, what justifies copyright and what drives copyright forward. And if we could have the next slide, please. So in all of these systems, you have a balance of, of interests. The, the, the need of the right holder to have some level of exclusivity in the market in order to get a return on the investment in producing knowledge and in distributing knowledge has always been a core part and core justification for copyright. Um, and by having that level of exclusivity, the, the uh, copyright owner or the author originally um, can either transfer that interest to a publisher or can license to the public or to certain specific parties the ability to make certain uses, whether that's a license or a permission. But the law itself recognizes certain uses should be permitted without the need for that permission, without the need for that license. And that is the, fair, that is the core of the fair use provision in United States law, which is a four-factor balancing test uh, that asks why you want to make use of the copyright owner's work, how much do you need to use in order to uh, accomplish your goals, and what would the impact of that use be on the, on the copyright owner's economic interests. And in particular, if the reason you're making that use is what is now called in the US a transformative use, because it, you are either changing the material itself by making a parody or a criticism, or you are just using the work in a new context. So for instance, a novel published for the mass market being used in a, in, in a classroom to teach critical reading would be an example of a transformative use that is favored and as a favored use under the fair use analysis. Um, and this, it, more recently, we've really come to understand that this balance is between author's rights and user's rights. And this language of user's rights has specific resonance in Canada, as I, I believe you will hear later from our Canadian experts, so I don't want to uh, step on their toes. If we could get the next slide, please. Um, so this, this connection between copyright and, and education uh, is deep. What, what I'm very excited about today's program because the good news for the educators in the audience is that the types of uses that are permitted um, are almost going to line up identically on either side of the border. So the, the bottom line is the same, but the vocabulary we use, whether it's fair use or fair dealing, specific steps in the explanation for why it's okay are slightly different. And, and it's important on the Canadian side of the border to be able to uh, understand the vocabulary and the mode of reasoning. The only other thing I would add is uh, fair use and fair dealing are, are by design a set of general principles about how to strike this balance between the copyright owner's interest and the user's interest. 
And then that balance gets sort of worked out in the specific uh, ways. In the United States, we have a, a more case law. We have more disputes around where that balance should be struck that help inform our application of, of the balance. Um, but the general, one can reason from first principles under either form of, of users' rights to see where, where you have an easy case and where you have a difficult case. And so even though Canada has fewer cases, from my perspective, and I'd be interested in our Canadian colleagues' views, uh, that doesn't inhibit one's ability to rely on the fair dealing or fair use provision as long as one understands the basic idea of how to strike that balance and the sort of uh, relevant considerations under any specific um, circumstances. And with that, I'm going to mute my screen and become a, a, a part of the audience seeking an education myself. And, and it's great to see all the friends out there and I hope everyone's doing well. Thanks, Mike. Um, come to the next slide, please. So up next, um, it's my pleasure to get to introduce Professor Karis Craig. Karis joined the faculty of Osgoode Hall Law School in 2002. She's the academic director of the Osgoode Professional Development LLM program in intellectual property law and a founding member of IP Osgoode, their intellectual property law and technology program. Karis, thank you so much for joining us and for telling us a little bit about sort of the development of modern fair dealing law and where we are right now. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you to, to Meredith and Will and uh, Mike and Peter and the team for all the work that they've been doing uh, to bring us together to talk about um, what is a very important topic and of course an increasingly important one as we're seeing all of our teaching now move online. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is just to focus my comments on the history and the development of um, of Canadian fair dealing policy and to put that in the context as well um, of the sort of evolving copyright policy conversation in Canada in the courts and beyond. So if I can have the next slide, um, I'm just going to start um, by taking us back to the original development of, um, of fair use which evolved in the courts in the UK as an equitable doctrine. And really over the course of the 18th and 19th century, as copyright began to expand, there was a real judicial effort to put constraints on the monopoly that copyright provided. And so it was in this effort that fair use first emerged. Um, what happened in, um, in terms of the statutory fair dealing defense that we know now is that in 1911, the UK codified um, the case law on fair dealing as it was at that point um, in this formulation where it specifically enumerated particular purposes for which dealings had been found in the jurisprudence to be fair. And so these will be familiar, things like private study, research, criticism, review, or newspaper summary are still in the modern iterations of this fair dealing defense. Now, historians um, have argued that um, it was never intended by Parliament that this should freeze the evolution of the equitable fair use doctrine. But unfortunately, over the course of the next 150 or 200, well, no, over the next, uh, let's say, 100 years, um, it became more uh, restrictive in the way it was applied by the courts in the UK. And so what we saw was um, a tendency to insist, first of all, that a dealing must fit within one of these enumerated purposes in order to even begin to qualify for fair dealing and to permit a fairness analysis. And moreover, that those categories had to be interpreted um, restrictively in themselves. And so, of course, this is the main distinguishing feature that we think about when we compare fair use and fair dealing. We think about the fact that for fair dealing, you have to get over this initial hurdle to fit within these purposes, to bring yourselves within um, the defense or even the possibility of having a fair dealing um, defense. Um, so this was the regime that Canada inherited and it became our um, provision in 1921 and, um, and the Canadian courts followed suit and interpreted the, um, the fair dealing defence very restrictively 
for many years. Um, a case in point and a good example to start with is the CCH and Law Society of Upper Canada case because it's the one we're going to be talking more about. But we saw when it was um, when it was first heard at the trial division in 1999, a classic Anglo-Canadian approach to fair dealing, which was to say, so here librarians were making copies of statutory materials and legal materials for their patrons. And um, it was understood that the patrons were engaged in research and private study, but the response of the court was to say, well, they're not the ones doing the copying. It's the librarian that's doing the copying. They're not engaged in research, so they don't even qualify. We don't need to consider fairness um, and, uh, and no fair dealing defense applies. So the next slide, please. Um, so that was, as I say, quite typical. But then what happened um, at the start of the 21st century is really that we had what has been described as a seismic shift in Canadian copyright landscape. Um, so with this um, Supreme Court ruling in the Taberge case in 2002, we saw a, a change in the way that the court was articulating the purposes of the copyright system overall. So whereas before the focus had really been on protecting owners' rights, um, and uh, users and the public interest came in a distant sort of second. Um, now in the Taber's case, it was stated by the Supreme Court that copyright law should achieve a balance between promoting the public interest in the encouragement and dissemination of works of the arts and intellect and obtaining a just reward for the creator. And moreover, um, that in order to achieve this balance, we have to recognize not only that creators have rights, but that those rights are limited and we have to give due weight to their limited nature. Um, excessive control by copyright owners can inhibit the development of the public domain and create practical obstacles to the proper utilization of works. And so here we see the, 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 the soil became more fertile for fair dealing in Canada. Next slide. Um, okay, so with this seismic shift, when, what happened was that the CCH case but now had made its way up to the Supreme Court. And so in 2004, um, the court was able to apply the sort of balancing principle to its understanding of fair dealing. And this entirely changed the fate of fair dealing in Canada. And I think this is the moment where we see the Canadian fair dealing um, doctrine depart from its sort of UK um, origins and really move much more closely uh, to be much more closely aligned with the US fair dealing um, defense. So here you'll see um, in particular the embrace of the language of user rights to describe fair dealing. So the court said fair dealing is a uh, user's right. User's rights are not just loopholes. They need to be given a fair and balanced reading. Um, and the statutory language was to be construed liberally the purposes were to be construed with a large and liberal interpretation to ensure that those user rights are not unduly constrained. Okay so what happened when they went to apply fair dealing um, to the librarian scenario here they found um, that the library was in fact facilitating the research of its patrons and so by applying its policies its research um, it's copying activities were research based and they were fair and they were fair because the court embarked upon a multifactorial fairness analysis very similar to the one you would conduct in the US in order to find that the copies were fairly made. This wasn't an outlier, this ended up being um, a new sort of landmark case that signalled a sort of new start for fair dealing in Canada. We saw that in 2012 with what we've called the copyright pentology. That was five cases that made their way to the Supreme Court, um, a few of which involved um, fair use, fair dealing, and user rights. Um, if I can have the next slide. I think the most important one for our purposes here is really the Alberta and access copyright case because that involved classroom copies that were being made um, by school teachers for their students. And uh, here, a large and liberal uh, interpretation of research and private study allowed the court to find um, that the fairness was going to be determinative and they found that the copies were indeed fair. 
Now, at the lower court, at the board, it had been held that the teacher's purposes were instruction, but not private study. And so um, they couldn't benefit from the student's purposes, which was private study and research. Um, but what the Supreme Court told us is that the user's purpose is the, is the key purpose that informs the analysis. And so the teacher's purpose in providing instruction was symbiotic with the student's purpose in engaging in study. The teachers had no ulterior motives. They were facilitating private study and the use, again, was fair. Um, just quickly, the SOCAN case also was about um, fair dealing. Here it was streaming music samples to help consumers choose which, um, which music tracks to, to buy and download. And again, a large and liberal interpretation of research meant that the court turned to fairness and found fair dealing. And um, the key here is that the analytical heavy hitting in this new fair dealing test is done not in determining whether the use fits the purpose, but at that second step of determining whether the fair dealing, whether the dealing was fair. And so again, the emphasis is on fairness and the, the purposes become much less of a barrier. So this is really the big takeaway. Um, sorry, I'll just stop my alarm, which is telling me I should stop. <laughs> so this is the big takeaway, which is that the main, well, first of all, in 2012, we explicitly added, I should say, um, additional purposes into the act as well. So now we have research, study, education, parody and satire. Sorry, last slide for a second longer. Um, so education is now enumerated as a purpose. When we put this all together, I think the takeaway is that the main difference that we've perceived between US fair use and Canadian fair dealing has been the apparent need to bring the use within the listed purposes. Now that education is an enumerated purpose that is to be broadly construed, we can assume that what we're doing in the open educational resource environment is going to qualify and get over that first hurdle. And then our attention is going to turn to the fairness factors, which are very, very similar to the US ones. And we're going to hear more about that from Lucy. So just to conclude then, I agree with Michael Geist said when he wrote, Canada now has a fair use provision um, in everything but name only. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much, Karis. And I think that's really important so what I'm hearing, tell me if this is right, that you still have this you know, list of enumerated purposes, but with the addition of education, that is a broad enough purpose that you can, it encompasses education broadly. You don't need to be tied to, is this physically in your seat at school? It allows everything we would commonly think of as education. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And we don't even need to rely upon the idea that the instructor's purpose is symbiotic with the student who really is engaged in private study, even though it's not in a private setting. We've got education there. We've been told a large and liberal um, reading of that is appropriate. And so I think we're straight into the fairness analysis with that. Great, thank you so much. That's, I think, a really amazing foundation to go forward on. Um, on the next slide, it's um, my pleasure to introduce Professor, professor Ariel Katz. Uh, he is a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. His general area of research includes um, economic analysis of competition law, intellectual property law, and copyright, with um, allied interests in electronic commerce, international trade, and the intersection between those things. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, I want to talk a few minutes a little bit about the, the most recent uh, case involving uh, fair dealing in education, and this is the, the, the York University case, uh, which I describe now here, here as the good, uh, used to be the also, the, now it's good and ugly, it, it used to be bad and ugly, and I'll explain what, what I mean by that. Um, so. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just by way of background, so what was the case about? So, uh, so York University was the defendant and, and uh, the plaintiff was Access Copyright, which is a copyright collective representing publishers and uh, some authors, uh, but not as many authors as they prepared to, to represent. Uh, but this was not a usual copyright infringement case. It was not even a copyright infringement case because Access Copyright 
has now does not have any standing to sue for infringement because it does not own the copyright nor is it an exclusive licensee and uh, as a matter of Canadian law as well as American law someone like access copyright does not have standing to sue for infringement only the owners can uh, so but what happened was that access copyright sued New York University after York as well as many other universities opted out of access copyrights licensing scheme. <clears throat> and the theory that access copyright uh, that was the foundation of, of, its, uh, of its action was that once the copyright board approved the tariff that it had proposed, then the tariffs becomes mandatory on users the moment the users make even one single infringing copy of one work from the repertoire of the collective. Uh, so then they had the claim that the York made some of those infringing copies, and as a result, uh, it could not opt out of the tariff. It had to pay and comply, have to pay the, the license fees under the tariff and then comply with all the other terms and conditions. Now, at the trial level, York did not seriously contest the theory that uh, the tariff was mandatory, but instead it relied on the argument that, well, he didn't make any of those infringing copies because he had implemented a fair dealing guidelines, and as a result, all of the copies that were made in accordance with those guidelines would be fair dealing. Uh, so whether the tariff is mandatory or not uh, would not really matter. And moreover, York countersued, it brought a counterclaim asking for the court to make a declaration that all of the copying that was done in accordance with those guidelines are fair dealing. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so the federal court of trial level decided the case in 2007. The outcome was bad and ugly. Uh, the court held, the court below held, the tariffs are mandatory, there is no way to opt out. And on top of that, that York's guidelines, guidelines were not fair dealing. Therefore, York made some infringing copies and as a result had to comply with the tariff and pay the royalties. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Now just, so the case was appealed to the Federal Court of Appeal who delivered the decision approximately three weeks ago. Uh, so now it's not bad and ugly, it's good and ugly. So the good part, uh, the Court of Appeal held that, that tariffs are not mandatory for users. What, what tariffs do, or court appro board approved tariffs, they only set the maximum license fees that a collective can charge, and the collective can only charge them from users who offered to pay the approved tariff, but then failed to do that. However, users who, who do not offer to pay uh, are not licensees, and therefore they can't, they have no obligation to pay license fees. Now, they're still subject to copyright, so if they copy and they don't have a license, they might be liable for copyright infringement, and the copyright owners could sue them. And if the court agrees that infringement had taken place, the court will determine what's the appropriate remedy and how much damages they would have to pay. Uh, but, but that's for a court to determine an infringement case, which was not that case. Access copyright has nothing to do about that. So that's an, an, a really, really good outcome. And why it is good? It's good. For the principal reason is that the mandatory tariff, if it had been affirmed, would or could effectively render furthering a useless concept or an interesting theoretical concept, but uh, for large institutions or even small one, you can't really be, I mean, you can always assume that there might be at least one infringing copy as a working assumption. And if that triggers an obligation to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or even million dollars, two million dollars, that would be for my university a year, uh, then it doesn't make any sense to rely on fair domain because you are going to pay $2 million anyway. So we just get the license and, and get over with it. Um, so that is now, this threat of the mandatory tariff is now over, which allows us to actually start relying on fair dealing 
in a much more serious way. Uh, can I have a next slide? Next slide, please. Okay, but now the ugly part. The ugly part that on the third inning part of the counterclaim that York brought, hoping to get a declaration that its guidelines give it kind of a broad immunity that anything done in accordance with the, fair, with the guideline would be fair dealing. On that point, the Court of Appeal agreed with the court below and held that those guidelines did not amount to fair dealing. Um, so the, the Court of Appeal held and agreed with the court below that the guideline itself did not ensure that copying that, be, that complied with the guidelines were necessarily fair dealing. And in some instances, or most instances, the court below found that the fairness factors pointed against uh, fairness. And York did not succeed to show that the analysis of the court below was, uh, um, was erroneous one. And as a result, the court agreed with the decision, the Court of Appeal agreed with the decision below and did not give York the declaration that it, uh, that it hoped to get. Uh, can I have a next slide, please? So the fair dealing party, you can think, well, it's, well, that seems like bad. Why am I saying that it's only ugly and not just plain bad? So for that, we'll have needed the next slide. And for that, we are, we're going to take two step backs to the CCH case that Caris had discussed. One important aspect of that case, there were many of them, is that the court asked itself in the case of an institution, a preliminary question, should institutions, um, do, do they have to show that every dealing by every end user with respect to every work is fair dealing in order for them to be shielded from liability? Or is it enough for them to have a general practice and, and, um, and, and policy that is on its own fair? And the court said, well, I conclude it's the latter. And because the, the institution can rely on the general practice and, uh, and, uh, and policy, and this comports with the purpose of fair dealing, which is to ensure that users are not unduly restricted in their ability to use and disseminate copyrighted works. Okay, so the institution can rely on fair dealing. They can either show that their own practices and policies were research based and fair, or they can also show that the, each of the individual copies. Okay, so they have the, the, the ability to choose uh, uh, which, which strategy they, they want. Um, and that was what York tried to do by invoking its, uh, its guidelines, and it failed to do that. Um, next uh, slide, please. Okay, but that means, and, and this is why it is maybe ugly, but not really bad, that York's failure to show that its practices and policies were sufficiently fair only means that those guidelines did not give York the broad immunity that it hoped to achieve. But it doesn't mean that the copies themselves were necessarily infringing. They may or may not be. Okay, we don't know. That was not an infringement case, and uh, so there's no answer to that. Now, so the issue is, was whether those guidelines are good enough to provide this immunity. The answer was no. And it's entirely possible that better guidelines uh, in a future case, or even the same guidelines, but with better evidence or better arguments, would convince a court that uh, the institution could enjoy this immunity. And I think I have just one last slide. Um, OK, but it's still an ugly decision uh, because the Court of Appeal affirmed the decision of uh, and the analysis, the fair dealing analysis of the court below. But many of the flaws that the court found in, in York's guidelines are themselves flawed. And they are, in my view, are inconsistent with the Supreme Court rulings and about fair dealing. And also they are difficult to rectify. I mean, if you really wanted to 
uh, to behave in accordance with what the court suggests, that would seem to be, in some cases, very, very, very difficult. So it's hard to tell how it will affect future cases. We don't even know whether this is the final word on, in this case, because, uh, I mean, the Supreme Court might hear the case, and we don't, know, we don't know yet whether it will hear the case and what the outcome will be if it hears the case. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that, or one of those, the ugliness of, of, of the fair dealing part of the, of the decision reflects the fact that this was not really an actual infringement case. So I call it a commutant case. It wasn't a real infringement case where co real corporate owners sue and allege concrete acts of infringement with respect to concrete works, which mean that their claims would then be closely scrutinized, their witnesses cross-examined, and so on. Instead, we had a case that was brought by Access Copyright, which is, does not have standing to actually uh, request the court to make determination of infringement. And it spoke in very broad and general terms about authors and publishers, but nothing really specific. And likewise, your counterclaim was in those very broad and general and abstract way. Uh, so the results, again, and it's just many of the troubling uh, part of the decision, I think, reflect this situation. We, we had a case that was really unmoored from relevant evidentiary record. And now that the threat of the mandatory tariff is over and what is left is and uh, the court also reaffirmed the point that access itself cannot sue for infringement. I'm hoping that if ever we have a real case with a real plaintiff alleging specific uh, instances of infringement, many of those statements by the court would seem to be irrelevant and not particularly helpful. But uh, it's hard to tell yet what will the future unfold. Thank you. Thank you. So just to sort of link that to what Karis had said earlier. So, you know, Karis was talking about sort of the general structure of fair dealing law and how you would go through that analysis, thinking through, for example, using an excerpt in an OER. And what you're saying is that the York University case is sort of hard to map directly onto that because it's talking about system wide guidelines and approaches, not a specific individual use case. Is that right? Uh, yeah, well, I, I made a more general even kind of question, even in the context of education, but, 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 but I think you're right in the one, in, if we are talking about a particular OER project, uh, then I think a lot of the thing that troubled the court with respect to York may not be at all relevant. Right? I'm not sure that they were supposed to be relevant in the your case, but they would be even less so in this context of you know a particular OER project and what it does to the work that are incorporated in it. Great, thank you so much. I think that's really helpful. Um, so on the next slide, it's um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Lucy Gibbo. She's an associate professor of law and an associate dean and an associate director of the Law and Technology Institute at the Schoolich School of Law at Dalhousie University. Her research and teaching focuses primarily on intellectual property law with incursions into contract law, e-commerce, competition, and fundamental rights law, specifically freedom of expression and right to privacy. Professor Gibbos, thank you so much for joining us and for talking a little bit about the specific relationship between fair dealing, education, and OER. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me this afternoon. And uh, good afternoon to everyone who's participating. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I think that Karis and Ariel have put uh, a very good background to the whole issue of fair dealing in Canada. A uh, very thorough historical um, expose and also a very clear uh, explanation of the most recent case involving York uh, and access copyright. I would like to go a bit more into OER and uh, what Canadian law might say about the use of OER. So um, may I have the following slide, please? 
Okay, but before we, we start with fair dealing, um, to me there's an important reminder that must be made, and, and that is to say that both the United States and Canada are members of the Bern Union. That is that uh, we are bound by the Bern Convention, and the Bern Convention, everybody knows, is the oldest uh, international treaty on, in the area of copyright law. And why do I raise this is because from the from day one of uh, this convention, which was adopted in 1886, remember, uh, from the very first inception of this uh, treaty, it, uh, it recognized a mandatory quotation exception and also option exception uh, to uh, allow educational uses. And this is Article 10 of the Bern Convention. So because Canada and the United States are bound by this convention, I find it's important to, to remind everyone that um, this puts everything into this uh, international context. Um, so Canadian law, besides the fair dealing exception or defense, uh, does recognize quite a number of exceptions uh, specifically geared towards education. So you have an educational exception for uh, reproduction of works for examinations, for example, uh, performances in class, broadcast in class, also reproduction for lessons. Um, but those, uh, those exceptions are rather um, formalistic. Uh, they contain uh, yes yeah, ser serious limitations so it's true that most people um re prefer relying on the fair dealing defense because it's much more flexible so i i wanted to me uh, mention these exceptions because they are in the act but because of they, they contain so many li uh, limitations uh, they're not uh, the easiest uh, to deal with uh, from the perspective of the um, makers of OER or uh, the users of OER material. So, um, and the relationship between these exceptions and the fair dealing is a bit the same uh, as what has been examined uh, in the United States, the relationship between section 108 on library use and fair dealing or fair use. Uh, so they coexist but most people will rely on fair dealing. So, um, next slide, please. So for OER uh, purposes, I would like to make a distinction between creating uh, a work that will, you know, that is the uh, open educational resource. So you create a method or you create a book uh, in which you may incorporate uh, existing material uh, and that material that you want to incorporate will probably be uh, images or texts or sound or videos that are that have been created by other people. So what is the leeway of uh, the uh, creator of such a, of a, such a resource to include uh, other materials? This was, would be something that I would equate to a quotation. So it's all a matter of uh, proportionality. And for this, we can certainly rely on the fair dealing. And one of the purposes of fair, fair dealing is fair dealing for criticism and review. And as uh, Karis um, uh, gave uh, in her uh, talk, um, the fair dealing purposes are, are usually interpreted very broadly. So criticism and review would certainly uh, encompass any sort of uh, quotation, as long as the five fair dealing factors uh, that are taken from the CCH case are uh, met. And, all, and there's an additional uh, requirement for the fair dealing for criticism and review, and that is that there is an obligation to mention the source of the work and if possible, in the name of the author or the performer or sound recording producer or broadcasting organization, as the case may be. So if you, if you think of the quotation exception that's um, uh, included in the Berne Convention, uh, if you quote, uh, you also need to mention the source and the name of, of the author if possible. So this, this fair dealing for uh, purposes of criticism and review is something that you can equate, uh, equate to the, the right to quote. And the fair dealing uh, factors, uh, if we want to summarize them again, uh, they are, I mean, you need to, to examine whether the, uh, the use 
well, where the purpose uh, uh, meets uh, uh, the fairness requirements, uh, what the character of the use is, uh, the amount uh, of the work used, um, whether there's an alternative uh, to that use and uh, what the effect of the use is on the uh, on the market uh, of the work. So the Canadian Fair Dealing um, uh, Defense has one factor more than the fair use uh, factors and that is uh, whether there's an alternative to the use or not. In, in the context of a quotation, um, and here I'm speaking a bit with um, um, knowledge from different uh, legal systems because there's not much case law uh, in Canada at all on uh, precisely uh, this defense of fair dealing. Um, but if you look globally uh, in countries like the Netherlands or France or the UK, uh, usually you use a work, uh, you incorporate it in a, a, a new work, and it needs to uh, illustrate the, or, or support the analysis of the new work. So it cannot be just a, um, a, a decorative uh, element in in the new in the new work. If you use the uh, somebody else's work in, in new work, it, it must meet a purpose and it must be proportional. Uh, so you should not use more than uh, uh, than would be required to make your point. But uh, I think that the basis uh, established by CCH case and the Alberta case. Um, provide ample room to, to find that uh, uh, the creation of an OER resource uh, uh, for purposes of education, but also uh, in this case, it would be um, incorporating a work in a new work for quotation purposes, uh, that would certainly be allowed. So this is creating the, the resource itself. So if I can have the next slide, please. Once you create that work, you will want to use it in the classroom context, or at least for educational purposes context. So you want perhaps to make repro uh, reproduction out of it, you want to display it or perform it in class or outside of class, remotely or not. Um, so for this, you could certainly, I think, uh, especially on the basis of the uh, case law that has been discussed so far, you could rely on the fair dealing for educational purposes as um, uh, described uh, by my colleagues. Uh, and this is section 29 of the, of the Copyright Act. Um, I, I mean, a lot has been said already, <laughs> uh, especially on the basis of uh, uh, CCH case and the Alberta versus Access Copyright case. But it is important to, to remind everyone that um, uh, that the court will look at the use of an uh, OER um, from the perspective of the uh, students uh, in general. Uh, and also, uh, there's no need for further creative activity. And this is what the court, Supreme Court said in Bell versus SOCAN, which um, also differs a bit from uh, the fair use case law in the United States, where as uh, Michael Carroll has uh, uh, reminded us at the beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, the Supreme Court in the United States has uh, repeatedly asked for transformative use um, as an element that will increase the fairness of a use, but this is, this is absent from uh, the Canadian uh, Fair, uh, fair dealing factors. So instead of um, asking for a transformative use, the other elements that we might need to look at is whether there's an alternative for the use. Um, but I would say that using an OER, uh, uh, you could hardly have uh, an alternative uh, to that use. So that would presumably uh, be interpreted uh, in favor of uh, the educational institution that would use the OER. 
So there might be two steps, the creating the, the research itself and using that resource. But I think all in all, uh, looking at all the factors of uh, both cases, um, I would think that there would be a certainly a, a good case uh, to be able to, uh, to use um, uh, all that material in class. Um, and I think this is where I wanted to leave it for now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Lucy, I had one question there. So you talk about this question that exists in fair dealing law about, a reasonable, about an alternative that we don't see as directly in US fair use law. But that means an alternative that serves the purpose as well. It doesn't mean theoretically could I come up with some workaround, right? Like there's a, a sort of reasonable purpose connection yes. there, right? Yes, correct. Um, uh, uh, the court will never ask to have a, as, as you mentioned, it's a theoretical alternative. Um, so like for a quotation or an image, in theory, you could always do something else. You could describe it instead of quoting it. You could try to recreate it, but that's not what the court requires, right? No. Okay, but, um This is also something that is a bit more, um, difficult to convey, I would say. So the choice of uh, integrating a, a, a another party's work into your own uh, should be used to criticize and comment. So you, by integrating that work, you will need to, to explain or to criticize or to, to review it. So which um, by itself eliminates using any other work if you're not about to criticize it. If you don't have some interaction with the work. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I think to talk through this, sometimes it's easier to talk in um, specific examples. So on the next slide, um, I'm going to introduce the next segment of our presentation, which is to talk through some common issues that come up in OER development. Um, there's a couple different categories. The way we're going to do this is um, so we'll talk through a set of examples, the first of which um, covers text excerpts. So in text excerpts, you'll often want to use a short quotation that might illustrate a specific rhetorical style. So you might want to talk about the rhetorical style in politics in the 1950s or the 1960s. Or you might want to talk about a poem that's proposed for discussion in our literature class or a passage from a foreign language periodical used in a language learning exercise, or a magazine paragraph used as a basis for a reading comprehension assessment quiz. I'm gonna ask um, my colleague Will to cut and paste those into the chat window to all participants, so you guys can keep them in mind as we're talking this through. But um, I think to start out this discussion, I'll ask Professor Peter Yazzie, who's a professor at WCL with Michael and with me, to sort of maybe take on a very first cut of how this might look under US fair use law. And then we'll ask our panelists to maybe add in from the Canadian perspective and then uh, open it up for discussion. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. And, and thank you, uh, Karis and, and Ariel and, and Lucy for what is really one of the, the clearest and most succinct and most kind of inspiring and uplifting presentations on the state of Canadian law that I've ever heard. I, I learned a lot, and I'm grateful to you. The, the examples that, that you've given, Meredith, all have in common that they, they do and, and will continue to come up regularly in OER development, and that they all involve using text excerpts in one way or another. And they're different in other respects. And, and they're different because in some of the examples that you've given, the poem for, for class discussion, for example, we know that the, the focus, the learning focus, so to speak, of the lesson for which that excerpt prepares the class is indeed that particular text. 
In other cases, the, the nexus, the connection between the educational objective and the choice of the item in question is a bit looser. So, and this goes to the question of available alternatives a little bit, I think, although that isn't a, a, a direct factor in US fair use analysis. It certainly can become one indirectly. Take, for example, the first case you gave. We want to show that in the 1950s, there was a, a sort of an upsurge in a certain kind of, of patriotic rhetoric among mass market politicians. And so we choose a speech to illustrate that proposition. We're not really critiquing that speech. And we could have chosen another speech, as long as it was a real speech by a real politician. We obviously couldn't simply have written our own speech to simulate what we believe is the teachable proposition concerning 1950s political rhetoric. And I would, in my usage, think of those not so much as uses for critique, as uses for purposes of illustration. The, the magazine quotation in which we, we, we give language learners a short newspaper article from a periodical in the country whose, whose language they are seeking to master so that they can both understand how the language is used in daily practice and also achieve greater reading mastery. There, the relationship between the text and the, the objective, although in, in extremely real, and what we would call in our fair use parlance transformative, is, is looser still. Uh, there might be dozens of, of articles that would have served that purpose, even though some article was needed to do so. And somewhat similarly with respect to your last example. All right, that's my long-winded intro. And my short answer to the question is that these are all obvious examples of fair use under US law. These are non-problematic examples, provided only that, because this is a factor in US fair use analysis as much as it is in Canadian fair use analysis, the amount of material chosen is appropriate to, not the least necessary possible to achieve, but appropriate to the, in this case, teaching and learning purpose. So there are no hard cases here. And we know that there are no hard cases here because all of the things that I've just described are done routinely in the commercial development of learning materials. Every one of the practices that I've just described is something that commercial textbook publishers do without concern or anxiety as they prepare the products that they sell often for too much money to which OER materials are the, the functional equivalent. And I will stop there. Thank you, Peter, for that sort of jumping off point from the fair use analysis. I wanted to invite um, Karis or Ariel or Lucy, would one of you like to pick one of these cases and sort of give us your opening position? We have this sort of set of text excerpt examples, you know, specific quotations, uh, a poem for crit criticism or analysis, the language learning example, or a magazine paragraph used in a reading comprehension quiz. Lucy, you unmuted first. So I'm going to have uh, Lucy and then Karis. Okay, thank you. Well, I think the, the two first uh, cases, to me, appear quite uh, clearly uh, to, to, to fall within the, the bounds of the fair dealing exception. I would probably uh, put them under the fair dealing for criticism and review because the purpose of using the work uh, uh, is to integrate them um, I think uh, in, in, a, in a new work to, you know, and the, the use, it can just 
be justified uh, in relation to that to that new work. Uh, so I would uh, invoke uh, section 21, uh, 29.1, uh, criticism or review. For the two other ones, um, uh, of course, it's a, uh, always a case-by-case -case analysis uh, and uh, facts may differ, but I, I would uh, probably lean towards invoking the, the fair dealing for educational purposes. Um, and uh, because education is so important and the, the, the courts have recognized it too, I would have little difficulty in thinking that a court might agree to uh, the two uses that are suggested in the last two. Thank you. Uh, Karis, would you like to add to that? Sure, I mean, I, I agree with Lucy's analysis. Um, I think sometimes we've seen that the more problematic examples are perhaps even just for photographic images, which seems sometimes like it should be a no-brainer, but um, the courts have struggled historically with the idea that you would include 100% of a work, right? And so when you're dealing with short extracts, there's always a sort of comfort level, you've only taken as much as you needed. But there are many kinds of works where taking a piece of the work or a fragment of the work and um, even a substantial part of the work is not going to achieve the purpose. And obviously images is a perfect case for that, right? You really, you need the full image in order to use it for the purpose. And so I think, whereas we have some old um, case law and the UK did as well, where they essentially sounded like you could never take 100% of anything. Um, you know, the, the UK jurisprudence turned in that, um, many moons ago and the Canadian jurisprudence has now as well, it's very clear that if taking the whole is what you need and it's reasonably apt and appropriate for the and necessary for the purpose itself, then then that of course should be um, should be fine. Um, I also just wanted to say that um, you know the alternatives analysis I think is potentially going to be the most daunting one. Um, maybe for the American audience thinking about um, whether you need to be able to show that you needed this thing or there was no alternative to it to achieve your purpose. And so I think it's really important just to resituate that analysis in the context of the multi-factor test. It's just one factor. It may be less fair if there were many sort of public domain alternatives you could have used. It doesn't mean it's unfair. And it's just one factor. And also the courts have been, in applying this, um, very reasonable and saying like, what, why did you choose to use it? Was it reasonable for the purposes to achieve what you wanted to achieve? And so really it is a purposive analysis. And I think we're usually on very safe footing in the OER context because we're not including things just for the sake of it. <laughs> I mean, by almost by definition, the reason something is there is because it's necessary or appropriate for the learning purposes that you're setting out to achieve. And so if you're confident in that, as someone who's putting together OERs, you should be confident that that's what the fair dealing analysis would reveal. Thank you. Um, Ariel, do you have a comment that you want to add on that? Or would you like to be um, the first commentator on our next session on images? I, I could add to the alternative. Uh, so, so it came in CCH as one of the factors, uh, but we again we don't have a lot of uh, case law beyond that. But but we do have from CCH and the other ca three cases from the Supreme Court. In all three of them, the court held that the this factor uh, uh, worked in favor of fairness because what had been used was what, what's reasonably necessary to achieve the ultimate purpose. Uh, and so in CCH, when the court discussed this factor, so it gave an example of, okay, one question, if there are other non-copyright material, that may be a factor. But also the court rejected what things would not be considered as alternative. So that's actually more important, right? Uh, so the court was very clear that just, just because the copyright owner is willing to offer a license, so you could get a license instead of copying without a license, this is irrelevant, okay, because it's a, it's a user's right, so therefore the, the copyright owner cannot take away a right by offering you to license the activity. 
Okay, so the availability license is clearly not an alternative in this context. In the Alberta case, the majority rejected the notion that the schools could buy more books instead of making copies. The court said, no, it's completely unrealistic. If the court schools are not going to buy entire books when they only use a portion of, of the book. Uh, also, do you need to copy the everything? Is it reasonably necessary? Well, in CCH, some of the cases that were found to be fair were copying of entire articles. Um, and on, on, in addition to that, even though we haven't really developed the concept of transformative use in Canada in the context of fair dealing, well, we did not exclude it, so obviously it could be uh, a consideration. Uh, but in 2013, the Supreme Court, in another corporate case called Sinar v. Robinson, it was not a fair dealing case, it was a question of whether their copying was of a substantial part. The court made the point that if you copy a work not to create a mere imitation of the work that you copy, but in order to create a new and original work on its own, then there is no infringement, period. Uh, which would be highly relevant in the context of how we are, right? You create, you're the author of a textbook, you create a new work, you compile materials, you put them together, you do something that is not just an imitation of those things, material that you use, you create a new and original work, and the court said there's no infringement, period. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the next set of examples and a reminder to the participants that these are in the chat and uh, if you're watching this later, they're in the linked slides. So talking about still images, um, the three examples we might talk about here are a historical photograph of a specific moment, like a political leader who is being discussed in a textbook giving a speech, um, reproductions of influential paintings and images of representational, representative architecture and designs, reflecting a specific aesthetic period, such as the Scandinavian modern period in an art history text. And then finally, uh, an example like uh, uh, micros uh, microscope photographs that are showing a scientific process being discussed in an academic journal being reused in a biology text. Um, so for these, perhaps we'll start with one of our um, Canadian commentators for the sort of original fair dealing and then ask for a fair use perspective. Would one of you like to jump in and talk about these three image cases? If I may. Of course. Well, um, so my first question would be to first ask whether on uh, these images there rests copyright at all. So the first one, uh, it's a historical photograph. We would need to find out when the photograph uh, was created, uh, who the author is, and whether the author is still alive or not, uh, knowing that, at, at least for now, um, the period of protection of uh, copyright in Canada is uh, shorter than in the United States. It's uh, still uh, burn convention length, uh, life of author is 50 years. So if it's a historical photograph, depending when it was made and when the author uh, passed away, if at all, it might be in the public domain, which would not cause uh, any uh, uh, problem. Uh, if I go to the third one, uh, microscope photograph, um, I'm not sure. So the this is a, a question also of uh, uh, originality. Um, in Canada, it's uh, skill and judgment. So in making a microscope photograph. I don't know if the author exercises sufficient skill and judgment in making that uh, photograph to qualify it for uh, copyright protection. This is uh, doubtful. And the same perhaps uh, also with the, the photograph of the political leader. If it's a news uh, photograph that did not uh, require any specific skill and judgment, then uh, you may also uh, think that it's part of the public domain. So for these two examples, uh, I would ask the preliminary questions beforehand. Um, but in both cases, I do find that um, 
they would probably meet uh, the requirement of the fair dealing uh, defense because you know they do serve the purpose and they seem to be proportionate uh, there might not be an alternative you know if you talk if you have a history book that uh, discusses the life of a, a particular political leader you will need a photograph of that leader um, so um, the only question would be for the second one uh, the reproductions of inferential paintings and I would suggest that you know everything is in it's a case-by-case -case analysis, of course, and it needs to be proportionate. So how many works have you used? And, uh, you know, is there an alternative? And does it meet the other requirements? And this, you know, would depend on the facts of the case. Um, yeah, so Thank maybe my colleagues have uh, others' uh, points of view. So I would maybe um, ask Will to sort of do that uh, paired analysis from a U.S. perspective and then open it up to the, the gallery for criticism and review. So sure. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. And, and we've, we've sort of stacked the deck here with, with clearly transformative uses, but we got to do that because those transformative uses are what you do when you make open educational resources in the first place. So exactly as Peter discussed in the last context, these are mostly transformative. And Lucy, I love the gloss you added about the questions, is it in the public domain or not? Is there enough creativity here to qualify? I love it because it's a great point. And I love it because sometimes a response we hear in OER land is, I don't want anything with uncertainty. If I'm gonna put an open license, I'm not comfortable with any uncertainty. And well, guess what? When you talk about the public domain, you have to wrestle with a small amount of uncertainty. When you talk about what qualifies for copyright protection. So, so thinking about the uncertain, the quote uncertainty, which I think we're arguing is not so uncertain around fair use and fair dealing feels to me analogous in some way to the quote unquote uncertainty of the public domain or other things like that. So, so fair use, big check mark. I think that's absolutely the case. Plus, another reminder that, that copyright law always requires us to be thoughtful about our practices, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do them or rely on them. Thank you. So um, I wanted to open it up to uh, Peter and to Ariel and to Karis and to Michael, whether any of you would like to jump in on that, uh, add any, any clarification or extension. This is um, not a clarification or an extension, but a provocation. Um, let's talk about the last one for a moment. The, okay. the micro photograph of the, 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 the internal cell process that is being taught. Um, let me say simply that <clears throat> it is the kind of, it has been, let me choose my tense, guardedly, it has been the kind of urban folklore of U.S. education that this was a case in which one ought to be very careful, um, assuming Lucy's extremely important premise that there is or might well be a copyright in the photo. And so much so that in many cases, uh, textbook authors and others have gone to the trouble of redrawing such images so that they do not actually make use of the photograph, but instead make use of a line drawing closely based on the photograph, which captures at least some of the detail that the photograph suggests. Now, let me be clear. I think that's nonsense. I think it doesn't reflect the current state of the law of fair use, but it is, all, it is interesting to note, it, it is worth noting that old ideas die hard and that sort of consensus views about certain kinds of practices once established aren't always sort of uh, affected by the solvent of new law. So this to me is an interesting case, not because I think it's different in terms of either how it is to be analyzed or how it comes out, but because it's, it is the kind of thing that, that currently 
real makers of real OER worry and scratch their heads about, not, not because it's OER, but because they are struggling with a kind of, with kind of legacy beliefs about uses in this category. Thank you, Peter. Karis, did you have uh, your hand raised sort of metaphorically to say something about that? No, I mean, I have lots of opinions and everything that's been said, but they're all in agreement. So I don't know how much I would add, except that, yeah, I think Lucy is absolutely right to emphasize, first of all, that we shouldn't assume that the works we want to use are necessarily protected, and especially when they are um, purely reproducing something that's found in the natural world, then, you know, whether that layer of photography brought or created a new expressive work, I think is very much in doubt in many of those cases. Many of those photographs really won't rise to the level of protected original um, expression that involves skill and judgment in the first instance. Also, the architectural um, building um, struck me as another example where we could say that, uh, that people are overly worried sometimes about reproducing architectural works or photographing buildings or public sculptures and we have exceptions in the Canadian Copyright Act for reproductions of architectural works and paintings and in photographs, reproductions of sculptures that are found in public places, public monuments. Um, and so again, these works tend to be um, non-infringing in, in the first instance. Thank you, Karis. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to say, don't, don't build your own sort of prison here. Don't jump too far into assuming you can't. Start perhaps with the assumption you can and you're figuring out what the most direct way is. Um, we're gonna go on to one final set of examples about, oh, Lucy, did you? Yeah, I just, small thing I'd like to add. In case of that, I mean, I, we all agree here that we should dare, you take risk, uh, proportionate risk and all. But if you integrate these photographs into new work, I mean, the one thing that, will, that might save you in a fair dealing analysis in Canada is if you add the mention of the source and the name of the author, then you're, you have very good chances. Thank you. I think that's really uh, important. Um, could I just add uh, two points on that or you want to proceed to the next uh, issue? Let me, let me go to the next set so we get to them, okay. but I'll hold a moment for you. Um, I wanted to follow up on Lucy's point. There was a question in the chat, and I want to be very clear that we are talking in all of these examples about taking these things and embedding them into a new or an updated or an existing openly licensed open educational resource. And so there are questions about how those two meld together. And the answer is that we are talking through exactly how and why the law permits you to do that. And for reasons of both being clear about what is yours and was the new content under the license, and as Lucy and others have pointed out, about enhancing your argument under the law, you need to be clear what content is yours, what content you are putting out under your open license, under the Creative Commons license, and then what content you have appropriately included under fair use or fair dealing. And that that notice is important for a couple different re reasons. One, it lets people know what's under the open license. Two, it meets these obligations under the law. And three, it flags it for later reusers who can, in most situations, as we've discussed, within this context of the OER, rely on your same analysis, but it is useful for them to understand what is existing content and what you are the author of. So I think it's, Lucy, you know, we hadn't talked through that legal piece, but it fits with good practice overall, which is as you put these OER out, mark clearly what is your new content under the open license and what is existing content. So we have one last set of examples, and I know a couple of presenters may have to drop off right at the half hour, but we might run a few minutes over. So if you do, I'm very sorry to lose you. But um, the last set of examples, which is again in the chat, is discussing um, video and music clips. So uh, doing a media literacy project and using clips of uh, beer advertisements to talk about how we've changed alcohol advertisement. Uh, using high definition clips from a Hollywood costume drama in a European history text to highlight a specific historical period. 
using um, recordings of popular songs on a course book of post-World War II Canadian society, or using extended clips of jazz instrumentals in a text on trends in mid-century American music. Um, so we started with Canada last time. Perhaps uh, either Michael or Peter, would one of you like to talk through a couple of these examples in the US context? Um, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I mean, the beer advertisements would be, you know, I mean, that is the classic transformative use, right? Those, those works were created for the purpose of selling beer. Um, and here they're embedded in a, in a context in which they are being uh, discussed critically. Um, this is exactly the kind of, of use one, one would expect to be permitted. Um, and, and you wouldn't expect this, there to be a licensing market for that, that kind of use. Um, and, you know, the second one's a little mildly trickier because the costume drama is not the only way to illustrate, but I, I think even, I mean, our Canadian colleagues, I'd be interested in their discussion of alternatives, but um, we don't have that as a fair use question. And as long as there's a connection between why you've chosen this specific costume drama in the context of your teaching point, that would still be a transformative use, that would still be the form, kind of use that would be a sort of classic fair use. And I don't know, uh, Peter, do you wanna take the music cases? Oh no, you should, you, you should, you should continue. Um, I'm, I would, my only, I would make only two comments before you go on. One is that the beer advertising case is a real case, which I really encountered. I encountered once upon a time, a media literacy teacher who was making his own beer advertisements because he felt that he could not use actual beer advertisements. And the other thing that I would, would, would mention about the second example, and we can come back to, is that the question of of how much you use can be can be thought of this question of proportionality that we've been discussing can be taught thought about in terms of length but it can also be thought about in terms of quality and i'm interested in what all of us think about the notion that if we're going to use hollywood movie clips in our european history curriculum we should be doing it in in HD quality. But let's talk about the music first. Okay, and yeah, I, I would hope that's not, that, that, you know, the quality of format doesn't determine whether the use is okay or not. Um, okay. And the music, I think the music cases, um, uh, again, are both being used in a teaching context in which they are directly relevant to the teaching point. So again, um, as long as that's the connection, uh, I think that you're well within the ambit of, of fair use. And the fact that it's a whole song in the case that of the... Um, oh, complete recordings. Well, um, the, the, in the case of the complete recordings, so, you know, a whole three or four or whatever, however many minutes, you know, a, a, an old-fashioned side. It, you know... I mean, the, you start to risk a, tr a substitutional effect, although if it's embedded in such a way that it's unlikely to have that substitutional uh, effect in the real market, then even an entire song, as long as it's connected to the teaching point, um, and if, if we need the entire song to make our point, or, or at least it makes our point more effective, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's embedded in a way where it's unlikely to be com a competing source, then yes, even that can be fair. Is that a leading question, Peter? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, it's just that it's just that 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 those are the, those were sort of the those were the sort of the the stingers that were were sort of implanted in those in those two examples. And Mike has Mike has addressed them, and of course, I agree entirely with his conclusions. Um, so you know, to sort of continue our dialogue. Uh, Karis or Ariel Lucy, which one of you like to comment on those examples in the music situation, videos and music from a Canadian approach? 
I was just thinking to say that one of the things I do encounter speaking to people who might not be so well versed in copyright law is the notion that different works are, are not created, all works are not created equal. That somehow it's, it's more likely to be fair if what you're reproducing is a poem than a beer commercial. And I think it's really important just to underscore that the analysis just says, is this a copyright protected work that contains original expression that's still under copyright? Has it been substantially reproduced? Is a defense available? And in fact, the same analysis is going to apply whether we're talking about beer commercials or Renaissance paintings. And if you can justify the use by connecting it to your educational purpose, your instructional purpose, um, then you're on just a safe footing if it's a modern beer commercial um, or um, a musical recording as you are if it's a, a photograph or a poem. Thank you. I think it's such an important point, right? Studying the world around us is studying the world around us, whether it's high art or advertising. Uh, Lucy, I know you have to go, so do you want to go? And then Arielle, we'll save the last comment for you. I just wanted to fully uh, support what Karis just said. It's all a question of justification. If as a teacher, you can justify why you use that work and so much of it, and if it makes sense, uh, so justification and proportionality, I think, is the key, um, and and you should have a good case. Thank you. Then Ariel, you've been so uh, good. Yeah. So well, I I just want to echo a very, very similar thing, but I think just in terms of uh, thought process or even just production process, uh, and, and more practical, I I think it's important to emphasize. So if when you want to use materials. Just ask yourself a, or a series of questions. Okay, why do I want to use this picture, this sound recording? Uh, why do I want to use this particular one, right? What do I want to illustrate? Do I want to criticize? Okay, so being able to answer this question. And then why do you, why do you use it in the way do you use it? Do you need all of it or is it enough to have part of it? Um, Again, to, uh, it, it also asks or try to understand from what kind of objections could be raised. Okay, so look at the what is the market for the work, how it is normally being used, and to what extent your use and the way that you use it could be a substitute for that. And if an argument is being raised that it is, what's your response to that? And I think that if we, if people go through this kind of series of questions and give themselves answers, you know, even maybe asking a friend or someone to be kind of devil's advocate and, and simulate some of this kind of back and forth, then you're more likely to do something that you could then defend and say, look, I, I've used what's reasonably necessary and it does not have a negative impact and I'm likely to have a negative impact. Uh, rather than doing something and then after the fact kind of say, oh, I don't know, it's there. Um. I think that's, yeah, I think it's such an important point and it really leads us into how we'll close out the webinar today, which is, first of all, I think you talked about the first inquiry being what is your teaching purpose? Why from a teaching context are you using that? And that question you know, that teaching question is tied to the creation and the use of the OER. And that teaching practice is the thing that we think is going to be the same in the US and Canada, right? Authors in the US use text excerpts for the same reasons as authors in Canada. So if you have a really good idea of why you're using this excerpt, why you need to use it, and why you're using the appropriate amount, that is not a question that is going to be, there's not a different teaching environment in the US versus Canada that will somehow radically reorient those questions, right? And so I think that's the first important point. The second is, um, as you say, to talk this through and to have a process where you sit down at the beginning of your work and think through, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What is my purpose? To sort of do the work. And a project that we're um, excited about going forward is a best practices for fair use and fair dealing for authors and users of open educational resources. And going through and sort of, you know, making explicit what you hint at, Ariel, of what is your process for that? 
and what is your community? And in the previous best practices, we focused a little more on the US fair use context. And they've been expanded and used some in Canada, but they hadn't been created sort of from original work to be a cross-border project. But as everyone said today, the way in which fair use law in this area and fair use dealing law in this area work, there is really this core analysis that is the same for both. And so we're really excited about that project and about our uh, potential co-conspirators here. And so we hope that you listening and you here on the presenters will um, carry with that. I have a few announcements to make about upcoming webinars, but I just wanted to offer anyone here any last words or any comments before I do that. So, um, um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just we, we have a, a very great case that it's not a Supreme Court case, it's a Ontario and Ontario Court of Appeal. It's called Allen v. Toronto Star that involves the Toronto Star publishing a photograph that had been on the cover of another magazine. Uh, and that was kind of to illustrate a point, and the court said that was fair dealing. Uh, and that before even CCH, I think it's from 1998 or 1999. And so that's a very a great case. Um, and, and the other one, again, about Canada and the notion that whether we have or not have transformative views. Uh, so I mentioned already, we may have it even in an earlier issue, whether it is the taking a substantial part or not. But even in the field of, of, of fair dealing, the Supreme Court in Sokan v. Bell said that the use doesn't have to be transformative. Okay, Sokan argued that because it was not, it could not be fair dealing. The court said, we don't need, we don't need, we, we're not bound to this American concept. Uh, it, can, it can be fair dealing even if it's not transformative. Uh, but it doesn't mean that if it is transformative, it, it's irrelevant consideration in Canada. Uh, it, it surely is. I think that's, yeah, important to remember that we often think about fair use as enabling more, but there are actually a lot of situations in which fair dealing might in fact allow extended use. Peter? Last thought only, which is just to encourage everyone to go to the project website for more information about the best practices work that Meredith mentioned a moment ago. Um, and that will be, that will be ongoing and, and we hope will yield a result over the course of the, the, the summer, the long summer. Yes. Um, so if you registered for this webinar, you have my email address. So if you're interested in working with us on that, feel free to send me an email, more information on the website. And then I just wanted to let you know about three upcoming webinars each Friday for the next three Fridays. Um, next Friday, we're running a webinar talking about working towards anti-racism and culturally responsive teaching in open education, thinking through the ways as we create these new resources, we're not, um, replicating and reinforcing existing inequality in areas where we can do better. Um, the one after that on May 29th is uh, titled Music to Our Ears, a fair use deep dive into using music in OER. So I think um, as a couple of people mentioned, there are types of works that can be sort of loom large in people's minds. And I think sometimes questions about music seem more complicated. So we're going to do a deep dive on music um, on May 29th, and then on the 5th, talking about using open licensing and OER to support LGBTQ inclusive learning. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and unless there's any final comments, we'll see you next Friday.